Wade Tron, and Alan Bach. And they're going to be talking about uh, the Smarty Roping Dummy up here, kind of the features, advantages, benefits. Uh, that, uh, y'all make sure your mind's to work in. And if y'all, Clay, if you want to talk about, yeah, yeah, they're on. If you want to talk about, you know, kind of the steers this week, you know, anything you want to go over, it's a question and answer kind of deal. It's laid back. We're streaming live on the NRSworld.com. I don't want to cut into your time, so I'm going to let y'all just get right into it. Y'all give them a big hand. We're honored to have these two right here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Um, we, were, we only have 30 minutes, so it seems like it goes by so fast. We're going to... Five more minutes left. <laughs> Seems like it goes that fast. We're going to talk about certain features, you know, of the Smarty. Uh, everybody gets mad at me and my family. I can't help but when I get into this, do I'm a natural born coach or a teacher, so I <clears throat> get caught up in the teaching part. But I keep trying to explain to them. It's like I've lived and breathed roping. That's why I created, you know, the sled to help at my schools and to have something that every part of the rope and I could break down and, and we could fix on the sled so I can't help but get caught up in the teaching part but Clay's going to actually um, talk about his boys a little bit and how he's taught them to have the right mechanics of their swing and how uh, what we did with uh, the, our actual heading part of it. <clears throat> I had a sculpture, I never was really happy with the bodies of um, the dummies that I saw, so I paid a lot of money and had this sculpturist in uh, Dallas carve out uh, what I thought was the perfect copy of a Corianni steer, and that's why like the head and the neck and the shoulders and everything uh, flow so good and the head loops work so well. So I'm going to turn it over to Clay. Yeah, like Al said, like I'm the, you probably heard me say a lot, I'm only big on using things or tools that actually help me and make me better and how I know if I'm doing it right. And that's, to me, the head on this thing is by far the best. And when I'm roping it, and if I'm roping it sharp, my loops look just like they do on a steer. And this is the only machine that I've ever roped that I was able to do that on without having to tweak, tweak my swing or whatever to make it look right. And that's because of the way the head is designed. Like he, Al said, he designed it to a quarter any steer's head. Well, and that's what we rope a lot. And this steer's designed that way. And so when I'm roping it, if my loops aren't good on this, I know I need to change something with my mechanics to make it right to how it looks like on the steer. And that's for sure helped me a lot. And like John said, he wanted to talk about the steers last night or, or the steers at the rodeo or what we do. And uh, last night to me was a prime example. The team roping was easy. It was easy for a reason. I think it's because these steers are old school. The arena's uh, the arena's not very big. If you were to go down there, I would love everybody to get to run one in that arena and see how hard it is when, when you when the gates open, the steer stands still, and then he takes off and run. I mean, it's a challenge then. But one thing that I did good last night, I missed one a couple nights ago. Uh, I was down in the room afterwards, and I said I can walk my face into the side of my trailer. I'm so mad because for a month I told myself, if you don't get a good start, don't take a bad shot. Al see me go to ropings all over. Do I ever hardly miss? Never. And I, for some reason at this rodeo, I will miss, and it makes me so mad that I can't stand it. So last night, got a bad go again, but guess what? My horse did not weaken at all. Did you see most of those guys, the reason they miss head horses head out when they try to go catch? That's part of the reason they were missing, missing the right horn. It's because their horses weren't working right. But what I've drilled into mine is, I rope the dummy on him a lot, and what I do, because he tries so hard all the time, that's where I rope and I'm always pushing him towards the cow, kind of towards the pin and making him go right to the left hip and driving him there. And then when I do reach a little bit rope, I can slow down. And it's easier to do it on the machine and easier on him than it is on a steer. And so I do that a lot, rope and make him go slow and slow down. That's exactly what I did last night. I did a terrible job of scoring because when the, the gates opened, my steer literally stood there and felt like, well, Trevor Brazil went. And his steer stood there too, but then he's broke the barrier by this much. And see, that's the tricky part there. You got to go right behind them, but if they don't go, you will run right past them, right at the chute, and you'll break the barrier every time. So that's why it was easy last night. But what made it easy for me to just catch is my horse allowed me to stay free and stay working through it. And now it's just like I was jackpot. A couple nights ago, I did the same thing. I took a bad shot, hit him in the back of the head, and so I learned from my mistake a few nights ago. 
and then was able to catch last time. But that was a lot of it. It's because of what my horse is and what I make him do to keep him working right. I'm going to add to that just a little bit. Um, to, to us, because we've done it all our life, roping is simple. And <clears throat> like to give you a mental picture of what Clay is saying, we always talk about our position as being lane one, lane two, lane three. And like I've watched Clay a lot, like when he's practicing, he's really working on riding strong in lane two coming out. And he, like on the Smarty, uh, a lot of what I try to get everybody to do him is being able to stay in lane two, keep their body framed up, sit up straight, and after they rope, pull their slack, dally, keep their legs moving, and keep going the same speed as the steer. It takes all the cues out. Does that help somebody at the NFR? Heck yeah, it does. Because like Clay is saying last night, he's like, what is making a person miss? If your horse is there and you just miss, well, that's on me. But if it's my horse doing it, well, then, well, it's also on you because you didn't train your horse, your motor skills aren't good, you're not riding through your delivery very good. But you'll see a lot at the NFR, the horses are bailing out right here and moving now either wide or checking off. And I notice Clay a lot when he's practicing on this morning, because he'll rope, get his slack, dally, and just let his horse move forward. Meaning he doesn't want him to shut down too much. And there's just so much different uh, information going on out there that, like, a lot of guys will rope at the steer stop on this morning. And I'll tell them, I don't think that's the greatest idea. Like, a little bit of that on a horse that's way too free to get him collected is okay. But most problems I see 99% of the time is the horse not staying through your slack and delivery. So by being able to work on that a bunch, you'll have your horse to where you go to a rope and you run 15 steers, he's going to stay with you all 15 steers. Yeah. Well, I, just like you said, you, I think you were even shocked when you see me rope at how much I did keep going. Like I did not want my horse rating a whole lot on this. I wanted him to keep going through my throw and that keeps him freed up and wanting to run until I throw it, and then even after staying moving ahead, you got the range, you can always slow him down afterwards, but it's hard to ride aggressive enough with your legs if you always got one that's wanting to cheat you and short you out. That's harder to do than anything. It's easier to slow one down. It's good. I know we're talking on a good horse, but even the good horses that want to shut down too much, it's way harder to push them through it and keep them going through the steer. And, and, and what's amazing is, a lot of it isn't our horse, it is us, but it's hard to do it on the steer. It's hard to train our body to do it on the steer and that's why this is so good. Well yeah, what he's saying is such revelation there. It's like you can you can hear somebody say it and teach it and you can think you understand it, but then the, to actually uh, execute the motor skills that it takes to keep your horse moving is another thing. And it takes repetition to do that. And that's why I keep telling people you've got to understand your roping, isolate a certain part of your roping work on it and then you do get all the coordination and the motor skills. Motor skills is just your hands and feet working together while you're while you're roping. And that's what that's what like say roping it and pulling your sock and dallying and going a couple jumps, what that does for you. Because you get your feet to you you keep riding your horse while your hand is finishing the delivery and pulling the slack and dallying. Well most people will quit kicking the minute they throw. We need to go on and on with that. Yeah. Um, would you would go ahead and let the boys roll? We're yes. going to kind of show off the fundamentals of the boys here. Um, when you actually, roping's made up of horsemanship, uh, mental aspect of it, and mechanics. And when you actually start off and teach, yourself or you know your kids the right mechanics the mechanics in the swing are the right combination of your shoulder your forearm and your wrist and if that swing stays in the right spot is that as far back as you can throw tyler could you well not right now but just show show everybody how because of your good swing you can just take a little tiny step back each time that's a lot of pressure to put on a seven-year-old, isn't it? But I know that I can do that because his mechanics are so good that he can just keep backing up, backing up, backing up. Clay's taught him to have the right body posture. 
Yeah, yeah. go ahead and brag on you. Well, no, I don't want to. This is what they do. I always tell them they should be good at it. But no, what, what I like to see too is, uh, I always say the rope's got to be your friend, right? And anytime you have to overthink it and be too mechanical, that's when you get in trouble. And I think I'm huge on a, on a good swing. And most people can get a good swing down on the, on the ground. But once you take it to the steers, it gets rough and you, and you change everything that you did on the dummy. And that's where I talked about a couple days ago before when I was here. I start out on the ground, move to the sled, and then take it to the steers. Because that's what our ultimate goal is. Our ultimate goal is not to be just the best smarty roper in the world. It's to... <laughs> it's hard not to when you see that. Let's challenge him. Let's see what he's got. Yeah, go ahead. They'd rather watch you than listen to us. Show them what you got. Let's see what you got. All these people here, can you get him? He'll be doing that too, huh? All right, the pressure's on. But he, like Alan said, he's done the same thing. That's the only thing I've told him is just make him move back. Same mechanics and oh, too far. But no, that. But that's what like people want to ask me how he's rope good. It ain't really me doing it. It's I tell him a little few things and let him have fun roping the dummies. He wants to do it. But I have told him the farther he gets back, get your tip up above the horns, if your tips below the horns, it's not going to go on the farther you get back. Just some simple things like that. And then he just loves roping. Hey, you, uh, you guys like to see Clay rope it a couple times? Yeah. He's kind of intimidated when he tired yeah. gets up there. He, he wants to match me. <coughs> but I am big on Notice how my swing, when I'm swinging it, you won't be able to, I don't change a whole lot in between my swing and my delivery. I'll just come right out of my swing and throw it. And I think that's huge. That is all about having a good swing. You guys hear what Clay was saying about where his tip was? See how his tip is up here? You see how it's real level? And if you can ever look behind somebody, that's where you really can tell about the mechanics. Like, is this, is this good mechanics? Is this good mechanics? I mean, when I said a shoulder, forearm, and wrist, it's like watch, like even the boys, you know, they're watching their dad. They're just like this. And it makes it easy to rotate around their elbow and have good extension out of their hand. Once you get that, a mental picture of that, well then you can obviously stand back and your dummy rope and does you some good. That's pretty impressive though, isn't it, to see somebody's kids like that just model right after. You can only imagine how tough it's going to be in 10 years when this boy's been practicing for 12 years to get his rookie start. Clay, you don't have to reach that far if you don't want to. I know. He, his favorite trick to do is he uses the kids rope thing very long and he'll reach a long ways and then hand it to you and see if you can do it. You're going to be tuning a lot of horses up before yeah. long right now. Well, I know where Robin's going, and that's why I let him do it. Can you stand back? Can you keep him for a little bit? I was going to talk to him a little bit about that. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I get, like I said, I get in trouble for not selling my sled enough. I get caught up in teaching. But when I, when I designed the sled, it's really been a family deal. My son-in-law, Blake, was right there beside me for the last four years. And trying to figure out how to how to make a better machine that would actually make application to making live runs where when you leave this you're able to go right into live runs and you rope better. And, uh, a couple things. One is I could never get a corner out of the other machines I was using and I didn't have anything to dally on. I mean not really dally to where you could the legs would come together and it would be realistic and Everything was always hollow. I, I tried really hard to make these legs solid and hard. And we put them on skis so that you could 
the machine could go really fast. I mean, you can work on it at 10 and 12 miles an hour, and that's great, but you've got to be able to speed the machine up and see where your horse's breaking point is and your breaking point is. I can almost tell you by spending an afternoon with somebody going 10, 12, 14, 16, 18 miles an hour where your horse is coming undone at and where you're coming undone at. Where you need to start relaxing and breathing and seeing the run more clear. There's so much to the speed part of the run. And just like the skis show you that, I mean, I'm into every part of this. The corner is such a big deal. Being able to ride high enough to you ride realistically on a, like when I say high enough, it's like 10 foot wide is where almost everybody rides and they ride back at about 10 o'clock right here. And to be able to ride the same on the smarty as you do on the live steer is really important to me because I want everything about reading the corner of where I'm at here and how long I go about. Uh, yesterday, for instance, uh, Paul Eves and, and, and Jake Corkle I took the Smarty out and pulled it for him. I was their driver. I'm down to being a driver now. I was their driver and like for instance, they were working on one thing that I put in my skills and drills video that's so good about helping you not get in too early. Have you noticed some of the healers getting in too close at the MFR? We all deal with that. You go out here to the World Series one of the biggest deals that healers make a mistake is getting in too close. So by being able to practice this corner enough, you can really work on developing your patience, using your left hand, getting your horse shortened up. I do different drills that actually make you do that. Like the one drill is what we call the corkscrew. It would be like play pulling the smarty out for me and going in a circle. And like Patrick, or not Patrick, but uh, Paul was, was uh, taking cattle at his horse, keeping him right here at 10 foot wide and right here at 10 o'clock, keeping his nose to the inside, keeping his shoulder picked up, and going around the circle with him and not letting him anticipate. Plus, it was good for Paul to relax and pull that and come up, keep his spacing, keep his spacing, keep his spacing all around the circle. Then I accelerated down the arena and gave him a corner. And, and I did that several times for both of them. Uh, Jade was talking to me about how he'd been getting in too early. Uh, these big cattle, are, they've not taken it very good and they're hanging in the corner. And most of the healers are getting in there too tight. So Jade is out there right now as we speak, working on keeping his spacing. He's doing this corkscrew drill out in the cold weather, which I admire some way they go out and fix stuff. He's really working on keeping that horse lifted up so that tonight he's not in a little bit close. And if you guys, did you notice uh, Jade in a tick too close last night? Well, he's out there adjusting and making sure that he doesn't do that today. And that's where the whole understanding and the practice program comes into everything. But uh, does everybody understand that little drill that I was saying? Everybody talks about wanting to be able to hold their horse out and read the corner, but until you actually design a practice program where you can practice those things, you'll always get in too early. I mean, whatever that is, if you're struggling with that part of your open, that could be your strongest point. But I do that a lot at home. I'll go round and round in a circle, keep my horse's shoulder lifted up, then I'll come out of the circle, accelerate, meaning get my horse head up, stride opened up, then I'll get collected. Sometimes I'll have uh, Tyler or Joel slow down and give me a real slow corner where it's making me have to get my horse lifted up and collected so that I, I'm not on top of it, but I can get slow down and then keep the feet out in front of me real good all the time. Uh, sometimes I'll have them come around, like accelerate down there and then turn and accelerate to where anybody struggle with uh, a steer that runs up the road, but you can do that 10 times in a row, and instead of you leaning over and chasing with your body, like, like I did for years, you can practice sitting up straight, keeping your swing good, and only using your legs. So there's so many drills that you can use, 
Smarty on where you not use your legs, use your hand, or drop your hand and really, really use your legs. And by doing it the same one 10 times or 15 times in a row, you, you're making it uh, a subconscious habit to where I see a steer run up the road, I don't have to think about what to do, but I immediately read that corner out drop my hand, engage my legs, and I'm after him, and I'm right there ready to heal him on the second jump. Or a steer that gets heavy in the corner, I don't want to have to consciously think about it. I know when he starts getting heavy, to just get collected, back out of my legs, and stay off the corner and keep the feet out in front of me. Because the best way to rope a dragger is early before he gets to drag it on me. So there's so much to, like I said, the machine and being able to use it and literally make application to going and winning money at the ropers. Am I out of time already? Uh, I think scoring, scoring in the corner about it's reading the steers. I mean, as a header, we're on our own. We don't have to worry about but that's reading the steer through the shoot. That's our job and to judge how fast he's going and how far we need to see. And Neil, and you're, you're reacting to split second decisions on what your header is. If the steer's getting heavier, you said you got to hold off if he's dragging just one second. If he wants to run up the rope, then you got to use your leg, give your horse's head, and try and catch up in just one second. And that's where that's what separates a lot of guys. Though, scoring is reading the steers really good, and healing, being able to adjust to the corner, and what happens. Yeah, I've heard Clay say several, several times that uh, here at the NFR, he really doesn't want to head for anybody. They can't keep their spacing around the corner. You guys think about what he's actually saying. The same thing. It's like you know, Peggy out here at the World Series. I would, when I'm at half time, to be able to help their help her partners. One of the main things I'm doing is trying to get them to use their left hand and stay back. I would rather see you be late and be there on the second jump every time <laughs> than to always be lapping up and getting too early where it breaks your horse's stride and your body posture. So, and being if somebody, if I was an analyst in there, uh, that would probably be the one thing I'd be pretty critical of in analyzing and talking about NFR runs on the healing side is, I mean, these guys can all swing and rope so good, but who's doing the best job of getting their horse in position to make that shot real easy? And, Throughout the week, the healer that does that the best will probably be the most successful. It, it seems like it's always been that way. Clay's been really good at being disciplined. Rich Skelton's been very good at using his hands and feet. I've always been pretty good at staying away from the steer and never getting on top of them here at the NFR. But that that falls true with you guys and every roping that you guys are at. Um, you guys have any questions? We got just like five minutes. Mm -hmm. We Usually wants to go to the left. Like the 99% will move over pretty good, or 
but the best ones are everything set up to go to the right the jackpots. There's a healing barrier. Um, so I want to, the horses that last the longest that are the fastest usually want to track over to the right. So I always work on drills to make them push over to the right and free up. And if you're roping it with someone and they're turning it, just tell them to go give you a couple strides after you rope it to push ahead and then turn off. And then you then you can make, I always say like, to me a good handle is, if you just imagine a big barrel off to your left, and you know how it's kind of round, just like you had to go around it. Not a sharp drop back. Like it happens here because there's some tight corners because the fence is right there and it's not very wide. But ideally at a normal rodeo or jackpot where we got room, we just like to go around a big barrel, kind of out and up and around and start the way back up towards the chute. Yeah, I like to slow down after I rope. Just rope and then I slow down. I mean, I go probably a little faster than you guys do, but that's to keep the pace of the run. And I'd say an open rope's a little tougher, but I advise you guys to go a little slower. Try and break them down. Go as slow as you can with the steer still hopping. Well, and here's something I do a lot at the schools is I think it's important to get a pattern on your horse to where everybody thinks that they pretty much are doing it all themselves with their hands and feet every run. But like for instance, Peg's horse, he's like one of the most automatic horses. And you see a lot of horses that seem real automatic. And automatic meaning if you do the same thing with them every time, you get their footwork right every time. And what I mean by that is like rope the smarty like Clay said, have the driver go two more jumps. And where you can go at least a jump or two, and then you can go ahead and ride out around that barrel like you said, keep your, your horse's nose in just a tick, shoulder up, and let him just make that smooth move out and get collected right there, and go straight across a couple jumps, and then slowly come back, and as you get that, that uh, pattern down, pretty soon, more and more and more, when you rope cattle, you won't realize how that horse's footwork will stay exactly in that pattern, and pretty soon he'll start just automatically handling cattle. You could put someone else on your horse, and he, you'll get compliments. Oh man, this horse is so awesome. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, and then on a, like on some other horses that I call practice horses, they're actually still really, really good. That's when I work on me more on this, where it's uh, I'll, I'll reach, I'll see how far I can let it out, and just actually how far I can throw the rope and catch it. Do different drills like that, or just come over the shoot with it, like the NFR. And I did get ready for the NFR. I got on my good horse and uh, just roped as fast as I could, but then went slow. Just went at him as fast as I could, kept him moving, and then just eased him out to not make it real tough on him. But yet to get him to where he's listening to what I want him to do. Because I always talked about the pattern. Even me, as good as I can ride a horse, I feel like if he doesn't want to do it, I'm in trouble when I'm trying to win. It's one thing if I'm practicing, but it's another thing when, like last night, I get a, the worst go possible for my horse. I kind of leave early, the steer don't go, I pull him almost to a stop, and then I go again. So he's not has no advantage on the steer. He's a great horse, so he gives me all he has, but if he wants to be just a little bit not great that night, it's really hard on him. And that's where putting that in him so we don't have to work so hard when we get somewhere makes it hard to win. Well, thank you guys. Uh, time's up already. If you guys have any questions, our little tables right there with anything but thank you for the time thank you thank you thank you all very much